have a very, very humbling and distinct pleasure tonight um, to introduce uh, a person that I know most of you know. I have seen many of you introduce yourselves because most of us have had the pleasure of studying on his textbooks, of looking at his lectures, of being inspired by his talks. It, uh, I have the whole biography in front of me, but in, in reality, I think we have uh, relatively few luminaries in our profession that are recognized worldwide. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Eugene Spafford, or Spaff, as he likes to be called, uh, the executive director of Sirius and professor of the Department of Computer Science at Purdue University, ISSA Distinguished Fellow, a member of our Central Indiana chapter, a contributor to the ISSA, a contributor to the profession, and a worldwide known luminary. It is my pleasure to invite him on the stage. Well, good evening, everyone. Let me set up here. So let me start off. Uh, because I'm a professor, you've been warned about this before. There's a quiz. So close your textbooks. Um, I wanted to I just get a sense here of some numbers. And you can look around. Just raise your hands. I'm not going to call on anybody in particular. But a couple things just, just as questions. Is there anybody here? who's ever worked with either the GEMSOS or SCOMP computing systems? If so, raise your hand. OK. So look around. I don't see any hands. Oh, one. There's one up in front. OK. How many of you have ever programmed or worked with a capability-based machine? OK, look at all those hands up. How many of you have ever read any of the papers by Willis Ware or Roger Shell or the Salzer and Schroeder paper? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six of you. OK, anybody here ever met Jim Anderson or Bob Abbott or worked with them? One, two, three. OK, I'll come back to that in a minute. So <clears throat> to give you a sense of this, when I was asked to give this talk, I was trying to think of what I might talk about because, well, you know, there hasn't been anything in the news about security or privacy recently. <laughs> so it was a little bit of a chore. And I've been working in this field for 35 years. I'm in my 27th year at Purdue. Um, and I started looking through some of my older presentations that I've given in other places, and it, it really brought back a number of memories. And I, I want to assure you, this is not a case of senility that's coming into play where I'm reminiscing about times past. As I go on here, hopefully you'll see there, there's actually something to this theme of looking back a bit. Um, another thing that really strongly jumped out at me was a, a bit of mythology. Uh, in ancient Greece, and, and that's not a personal recollection of ancient Greece. Uh, yeah, I, I do have a few gray hairs, at least where I have hairs. So, uh, uh, but mythology, if you think back, there was uh, an individual by the name of Cassandra who lived in the city of Troy, and she had angered the gods, and she had been cursed with, the, with both the ability to see the future and the curse that no one would believe her. And all along, I realized that much of my trajectory through my career has been much like Cassandra, in that I've seen things coming and I've talked about them in many different venues, but not taken seriously about the advice that I gave. And that's really illustrated in, a, in part by that little quiz that I gave you. You here are security professionals. 
you're at the top of your field or near the top of your field. Uh, the ISA, ISSA has some of the very best people in security. And yet, of, as a field, we do an incredibly bad job of looking to the past and finding out what's already been learned. I raised a number of these issues. SCOMP and GEMSOS were two systems that were evaluated at the A1 security level under the old Crom and criteria. And if you've never even heard of them, which is typical, you know, there's a bit of history where we engineered incredibly secure systems, and it's largely lost now. In fact, in most curricula, in, in college uh, uh, curricula, we don't even talk about them. It's hard to find them mentioned in most textbooks. And I mentioned capability machines. The most secure systems that were produced were done on capability machines because the hardware assisted in building them. But try to buy one now. And you can't find them because capability machines required extra memory accesses to compute. And so they were slower. And as we all know, we can have an insecure machine as long as it's fast. Um, and I mentioned a number of people who were very important to the field, whose writings and whose papers form the foundation of what we do in security in the 70s and 80s. But most of you probably have not read those papers or know those people, in part because their works came out before uh, Word or FrameMaker or LaTeX, and they were done on typewriters, and they're not in Google. They're not in Bing. You actually have to go to a library, which seems to be something that my students no longer know quite what that is. We have decades of experience that we just have not applied. And I fear that many of the things that I have talked about over the last two decades are going to be similarly lost uh, because they simply don't apply to what people want to do rather than what they should do. So in particular, what brought this to mind as I was looking through some of my presentations is a realization of an anniversary. And for those of you who read my serious blog, you've already seen some of this. <clears throat> but on November 2nd, just a few weeks from now, it is the 25th anniversary of the internet worm. 25 years. It, it really seems hard to believe that that much time has gone by. <clears throat> for those of you that that's just a couple words, you, you really don't necessarily remember that or weren't around at the time that occurred. It was um, an occasion where many of us woke up on November 3rd and discovered that our computer systems of the nascent internet at the time weren't responding. They were very sluggish. Some of them were down. Others were running just fine. Uh, machines that came from uh, com companies like uh, AT&T, their 3B20s ran fine. Sequent computers, for any of you who have ever heard of Sequent, or Pyramid, our Pyramid machine was running fine. Uh, but some of our uh, sons and, and Vaxes were not performing properly. What had happened was that there was a bit of malware uh, that had spread through the internet, installed itself on these machines by taking advantage of security flaws in several of the software programs, and then copied itself to yet other machines, something we're all familiar with now. But at that time, it was the first time it had ever really happened. It was a wake-up call of sorts, except nobody really woke up other than to complain about this. Everybody talked about it. Wow, wow what, a, what an amazing thing this was. It turned out that it was a program that was written by a graduate student who was trying to, he claimed, uh, find out how big the internet was and whether he could write such a thing. And he had made a couple software errors in the code so that it spread out of control. It wasn't malicious, it wasn't intended to be, but it really was a surprise for everyone because we hadn't encountered it before. And so it got a lot of press. 
Now, at the time, I was studying uh, malware, what we then called computer viruses. And this was not a virus. This was part of, part of my uh, discourse with the community uh, because it, it didn't behave like a virus. It didn't add itself to existing programs. It was a standalone system of its own. Uh, this distinction has effectively been lost uh, in time because now the vernacular is anything that we don't want running on our systems is a virus, or so it seems. Um, and despite this, looking at malware at the time, I had been studying it for a little bit, uh, there were several hurried meetings about that particular instance with the internet worm or the Morris worm, as, as it was called. Uh, there was another one that occurred around the same time, uh, shortly after the IBM Christmas card worm. Um, somebody else had written. There was something that was, appeared on the NASA SPAN network. So within a period of about six months, we had several of these that appeared. But at the, out in the wild on desktop computers and early PCs, remember this is back in 88, there were only about 20 real computer viruses that we knew about. So in that November, we had one worm program, 20 computer viruses. And over the space of the next two or three years, we had a number of uh, meetings by researchers and people in, uh, in government to talk about malicious software. And we were never able to attract anyone from the vendors. We could never get their attention to show up at these meetings. We talked about defenses, about ways that things could be done in the systems to prevent future occurrences. So I remember one discussion where we were talking about a combination of whitelisting and integrity monitoring. And what we really wanted was for software not to self-modify that when the software was installed, it would stay without any changes, because then we could run these kinds of defenses. About three months after that, Microsoft issued a release uh, to their operating system of the time, where all of the software, instead of using configuration files, modified themselves to include the configuration settings. So all of those defenses went away. I think it was a year later, two years later, uh, we were talking about how it didn't require uh, binary code to execute these and how vendors had to be really careful and responsible about including anything that was executable. And about two months later, the version of Word with Visual Basic was released with a concept virus interestingly provided for you on the release disk they were never able to find who put that on the release disk because their configuration management was so poor. Something else we'd been talking about. Now that's not to single out Microsoft. They weren't the only vendor that didn't attend those meetings and that really didn't pay any attention to security or us at the time. But to give you a sense, we were talking about fundamental architectural changes that would be simple to introduce that would head off most of the problems. And not only did the vendors not pay attention to us, but when we actually approached them with some of these ideas, we were told that it would be too expensive to implement. So, 1988, it was headline news when 6,000 machines were infected with one computer worm, and there were 20 viruses. I reached out to some of my colleagues at McAfee and Sophos and got numbers from them. As of the beginning of this month, there are 180 million distinct malware signatures on file with those vendors. 180 million, from 20 to 180 million. That's increasing at the rate of approximately 2 million per week as current numbers. There's no reason for that. The fact that our systems are still vulnerable, still have uh, architectural decisions baked in that allow that kind of 
increase in malicious software to spread is really horrendous. And for us to say that we have any kind of a handle on that is really false. Two million new ones per week? There's a reason that those numbers are increasing like that. It's because they work. We can't possibly claim that we've solved any of it. The fact that we no longer have news headlines about, about worms and, and similar network-wide threats is because they're so commonplace. There are several hundred, if not several thousand, botnets out there that are active at this moment, causing damage. And for anybody to say that we've solved the problem of network malware, just try saying that to the folks at Saudi Aramco or at uh, uh, Qatar's uh, Razgas that had tens of thousands of machines wiped by computer uh, viruses and worms. Another bit of technology I remember well back in the early 90s was firewalls. First firewall, uh, Marcus Ranum developed and, and uh, was part of the group that developed it for deployment at the White House. And uh, I was one of the early researchers doing work in firewalls and doing some development in firewalls. Uh, and I remember those days that uh, as a result of that, I got invited again to some high-level workshops that had some people uh, from Washington, from some companies involved, a number of people from academia. And we had a lot of discussion about firewalls, how they should be structured and funded and so on. And I was making the argument that all the money people were talking about putting into firewalls, if they use that instead of putting the money into hardening the endpoints, all that was going to happen is that we would have a shell around a bunch of vulnerable machines. Now, I didn't have quite the, the wit at the time to come up with the, the line that people have commonly used now about a hard, crunchy shell and a soft, chewy interior, but that's basically what our networks became. Because I was told by people that getting fixes into all the endpoints is going to be too hard and too expensive. But firewalls, hey, that'll solve everything. Well, obviously firewalls haven't solved anything. We have a barricade up because the machines are not sound. We don't have control over the users. We don't know what kind of software is coming in or out. And what I said about not having the secured endpoints not only came true, but now look at all of the things we have that don't have a perimeter. You have smartphones, you have laptops, you have tablet computers. There is no perimeter anymore, and those things still aren't hardened. We still didn't learn our lesson. So firewalls were a temporary stopgap that did really never worked anyhow. That's why um, if you have a firewall and you're running a, uh, something in a commercial realm, you also have to have an IDS an extrusion prevention uh, system, uh, source code encryption, and uh, vulnerability scanning, and you know, add another five or six things that are all add-ons because the underlying software isn't dependable. In some respects, this is because our field is very young. Really, it's, it is, it's very young. Computing as a whole is very young. Um, I'm at Purdue University, and last year we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the founding of our department. It's the oldest department in the Northern Hemisphere and the second oldest in the world. 50 years isn't very long for an academic discipline. Um, that, um, the, the phrase that I heard at, at one point is, at this stage in its development, civil engineering hadn't invented the right triangle yet. Uh, we have a long ways to go. Part of it is we don't have definitions and metrics that make any sense. We have used some very ad hoc terms that really don't adequately describe in a formal way what we're doing. We have measures. We don't have metrics. So measures, when I talk about the number of viruses, that's a measure. You can't use that number really to, to uh, determine if you've made a difference in a significant way by comparing it with other numbers. 
What is it we're going to measure? What is security? How do we even define security? If you think about it, most people, when asked to say, well, what is security, will say, oh, it's, it's confidentiality, it's integrity, and it's availability. Well, what does that mean? How do you measure two units of confidentiality? There's no metric associated with it. And integrity and availability are not independent measures. If I delete all your data, it's not available. So is that an attack on integrity or availability? It's both. They're not independent. It's not surprising. How many of you know where that came from, where CIA came from? Anybody here? Right? We all repeat it. We all hold that up as our mantra that this is what security is. We don't even know where it came from. Well, I'll tell you where it came from. You can ask uh, William Hugh Murray or Don Parker, and they'll tell you. Uh, Bob Courtney. Anybody, anybody here ever work with Bob? One person? Ralph? Two? Maybe only two people. Uh, Bob Courtney was an early pioneer in computer security at IBM. And in 1971, he had to go before a group of security analysts, system analysts, at an IBM event. And he was going to be doing a presentation on what it took to secure IBM's products for customers. And about 20 minutes before he went on stage, he came up with the CIA idea. He thought it would be fun to use because CIA having the same acronym as the agency. It was invented 20 minutes before a presentation for the presentation, and it stuck. And I'll tell you as an anecdote, that's exactly the same way, effectively, that the one month expiration time for passwords came about. And I've written about this in the past. Because back in the 1970s, the DOD auditing group at the NSA knew that passwords were vulnerable to being guessed or cracked, and they had to come up with a time. So they asked one of the engineers how long it would take to cycle through all possible passwords on the fastest computer they had. And the guy said it would take about a month. And so they put a month as the expiration time that they required on passwords. And we still use that to today. How does that make any sense? Um, to try to come up with anything, a few people have made a stab at coming up with metrics. Uh, Don Parker's hex ad, uh, for those of you who've seen that. Good attempt, still doesn't solve the problem of independence, still doesn't come up with metrics for things we have to measure. And until we're able to actually quantify what change, changes we make in systems bring to better security, we're not going to make any progress because the only measures that we really have available to us that are commonly used are megabytes and dollars and maybe gigahertz. All right, so we're, we're, we're saying that the system runs fast and has a lot of memory and is cheap. Where is the measure of security associated with that? We don't have one and we can't come up with a meaningful one that is going to resonate with the people in the boardroom or with the public or with policymakers. So it's no surprise that we haven't been able to make much progress. Where we have made progress is in those things that we can measure. You know, there's that old joke about the policeman coming on the drunk who's on his hands and knees searching along the street, and he said, what are you looking for? He said, my car keys. So the policeman starts looking at a couple passerbys, looking, and they're looking all over the sidewalk, and finally the policeman says to the drunk, are you sure you dropped the keys here? And the drunk says, no, I dropped them across the street, but the light's better over here. That's basically how we approach our measurement for security. We measure those things that we think we can measure, and where we can see a difference, we say that's an improvement. And yet, paradoxically, there, there are things that really aren't security. So one example of that is patching. We have this idea that patching systems is somehow related to security. The ability to patch a system does not imply that it's more secure in any sense of the word. The fact that you have to apply patches to it in an urgent fashion means it's brittle and badly written. Uh, 
the sooner we're able to put that canard to rest, I think the better off we're going to be. But it's very difficult because we have to talk about something to management that we're doing quickly. Um, and, and that turns out to be a big one. I mean, when we look at that, if we talk about patching systems is something that's important for security, look at what companies are paying for vulnerability disclosure. Uh, the news yesterday had a story of someone in Australia getting $100,000 from Microsoft for a flaw. Well, there's a cost for security. Let's take that into the boardroom and say, we need to start offering money for vulnerability so we can patch them more quickly. I don't think that's going to go over well either. But it might actually help get across the point that uh, we, we are using systems that are fundamentally unsound. Another problem here is we, we often use phrases that are not based in, in uh, anything sensible or measures. I mentioned the bit about a one-month password. Another one like this is people who will quote to you no security through obscurity. And they don't really understand what that means, but it sounds good. It's actually derived from something known as Kirchhoff's Law in cryptography. And Kirchhoff's Law basically says that any system that depends only on secrecy is not secure. That's different than saying no security through obscurity. Because we use obscurity, we use secrecy all the time for better security. If you don't believe me, publish your password. We hold that as a matter of secret information, and it enhances our secrecy. So please don't say no security through obscurity anymore, because it's just flat out wrong. But again, it's saying those things without thinking. It's using the CIA model. It's using the one-month expiration that causes problems. I'll give you a third one that annoys me. And that is people who are able to come up with a new way of breaking into a system, and for many systems, that's really not that hard. But they come up with a new way of breaking in the system, and they're labeled by the press and some of us as security experts. That's like saying that somebody who's good at stealing cars is an automotive engineer. <laughs> it should be insulting to every one of us who considers this our profession. And I think part of that is because some of our experience is aging out. Uh, some of the things that we've learned have been forgotten. Some of it has to do with the change in technology. When there were only two or three large computers in an organization and that was it, we really had to secure those computers and we worked very hard at it. Now when there are thousands, it's very difficult to make sure that they all are secure in some way or another. And so we fall back and resort to trying to do things on the network. Uh, tonight, I'm here instead of in Baltimore where I'm being inducted into the Computer Security Hall of Fame. And thank they, they didn't bother to see if there was a conflict. And they, they were disappointed when I told them I'd made a promise to you first. Um, And, and I really wasn't saying that to get applause. Uh, it was for the next thing, which is, I, I'm the youngest person who's been inducted into that. And I'm not exactly that young. Um, and, and this is showing up in where a lot of our expertise for people who knew about securing those large scale systems and who have that long baseline of experience to give us the perspective about the things that we're doing day to day without thinking where they come from, we're beginning to lose some of them. I made a short list. Um, we no longer have with us Jim Anderson, Roger Needham, Gene Schultz, Bob Abbott, Harold Highland, Hal Tipton, Paul Carger, Lynn McNulty. These were all people who really contributed vast amounts to the field and had a tremendous wealth of knowledge about how systems could be developed. These are people who've used systems that were secure. Systems 
Gemsos and Scomp and Multics. Multics had never been broken uh, by, by anyone, and many people tried. It was well funded because it was designed well. And it didn't surf the web or allow you to play Grand Theft Auto 4, uh, and that may be a part of it. Our view that every computer we have has to run every application we want is at the root of a number of our problems. But the work of those individuals, you won't find it cited by many researchers or people in industry now, in part because very little of their work is available through Bing and Google and online. And that's something else we've lost. As we've spent more of our time online, we're actually not paying attention to foundations in our field that we should. So for example, Willis Ware, giant in the field, led some of the very first penetration analyses, the very first security plan, chaired the group for Congress that developed the fair information practices. And yet, you cannot find his reports online unless you search very hard. Matt Bishop at UC Davis uh, digitized it a few years ago, and you can find it through the, the UC Davis lab, but otherwise you won't find it. I mentioned SCOMP and GEMSOS were A1, formally proven systems. How many of you have ever done a formal proof of a computer program? Anybody? I gotta talk to you, but <laughs> uh, somebody over there, two over here, very, very little, and yet, it's not a solution for everything. In fact, it's not a, not a solution for many things. But if you really, really want to be sure about how certain software behaves, that's an important technology that we really ought to use more and know more about. Capability machines with ring structures, as I mentioned, Multics was built on that, SCOMP was built on that. Some of the guard systems that are still in use in the government are built on that. It was. Um, Again, the only hardware that a, that a completely machine, uh, secure machine had been built on. Uh, Roger Shell was the one who conducted the penetration analyses on Multics and developed the techniques for formal verification. Uh, he's just gone back, by the way, into academia. He's now an adjunct professor at uh, USC, for any of you who are interested. Uh, so Roger's still doing well. And the Salzer and Schroeder paper collected 15 years or so of experience on system faults, penetrations, and design into a set of design principles that most vendors ignore to this day. That would be an interesting thing for any of you tomorrow. If you find any technical people out at the exhibitor booths, ask them if they use Salzer and Schroeder principles in design of their software. And then chuckle evilly. So, um, let me sort of tie this up with a few comments about the future, or the near present, perhaps. We are having problems now with supply chain issues, and they're getting worse. We've had supply chain issues for a while, and this is buying hardware and software that has been produced by or in uh, countries where we don't fully trust the government or some of the organizations. And up until about six months ago, we didn't have reason to believe that one of those countries was our own. But how do you know that what you're getting doesn't have a back door in it? How do you know that what you get as hardware doesn't have some additional feature etched into the chips? we do not have the technology to know, and we haven't built up the system of trust that's uh, sufficient to give us strong confidence that what we're building on is sound. And now, with recent revelations of what's been going on and the criticality of some of the systems involved, we have people in other countries talking about building out their own industries to produce their own chips and their own operating systems. Brazil is talking about entering into the semiconductor business. China is talking about forbidding certain U.S. imports. Many other countries that are uneasy about that. That's going to lead to a balkanization of systems because many of those people, first of all, don't program as well, are going to program to different standards, especially to keep interoperability down, and it's likely to lead to uh, a, a number of problems for us as a field. 
As an international organization, we should be worried about that. Instead of partitioning our systems, instead of encouraging a Tower of Babel approach, we should be finding ways to increase the trust, the base trust that we have in all our systems and being able to verify them. We have too much effort now being paid to building up cyber weapons instead of building up cyber trust. And we're going to be far better off if we have a basis that we can use to trust our commerce and our communication and then learn to speak with each other a little bit better rather than to threaten. Second area where we have problems is the whole social media arena. And that's going to get worse. Now, I suppose if you follow my Twitter feed, you wonder how it can get worse. But what I'm concerned about is I'm seeing more and more cases of harassment, of stalking, and of criminal activity that really can't be stopped well. The kinds of things where you see um, accounts of advertisement for basically human trafficking occurring as side channels on some of the social media, where you have young children being harassed to the point they commit suicide. One of my graduate students uh, lost her job because of harassment and accusations by someone uh, who is still harassing her and is unable to get law enforcement to get it uh, concerned enough where they're able to take action against the person, even though they know who it is. This is only going to get worse as we have more people around the world connecting up and who are sensitive to some of the things that are going on. Um, we're going to have to worry more about who really owns what we're running, especially as we move more into portable systems. Uh, in, in particular, I'm kind of horrified by some of the accounts I read of the baseline of updates of some versions of Android that are available on phones. There are, there are something like 37 different versions of Android currently out on phones, and some of them haven't been updated in over two years. That should be frightening, especially if you own one of those phones. Uh, lower level attacks. If you go to most universities now that are teaching computer science, you will not find students spending time learning to program an assembler language. They no longer know how to work at the level of the machine. And why is that? That's because employers want them to be able to write PHP and Ruby on Rails. They want them to work with big data. And there's only so much time in the curriculum. You don't have vendors requiring students to know how to work with the base machines and what the assembly language is like. So it's being cut out of the curriculum. I think that's a tragedy that's going to lead to further results down, down the line because we need that for our forensic specialists and to understand some of the security attacks that occur. SCADA, PLI, uh, some of the stories that have been coming out there are very worrisome. You, of all audiences, are probably more aware of that than some, but we have an awful lot of people in governments who aren't taking it seriously because the people who operate the SCADA networks are saying, it'll be too expensive to fix. Where have we heard that before? But when we start having utility systems shut down as pranks or worse as matters of extortion, I think suddenly people are going to wake up and wonder what's going on and it's going to be a real mess because it isn't something that can be fixed overnight. Another area like malware that we sort of take for granted now is spam. That problem just continues to get worse and worse and the noise that it generates means that it's very difficult for us to detect some kinds of phishing attacks and exploitation exfiltration when 99% of the traffic at some ISPs is unwanted spam email. Um, it's a horrendous problem that we, we haven't really seemed to face up to very well. So the good news from all of this is I don't think any of us are going to want for employment for years to come. In fact, I don't think any of us need to ba basically change what we've been doing. That what we've been doing will continue to, to be in demand. But that's also the bad news. Because until we're able to change the mindset, 
until we're able to look back at the past, right? You know, the old guy reminiscing here. But until we look back at that past and learn some of those lessons and really apply them, whoever comes after us is going to have the same sets of problems. We're making the same mistakes over and over again. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention and tell you, you kids keep off my lawn. Thank you. I'm willing to take some I'm willing to take a few questions if anybody would like. So there are mics in the audience if you want to use them. One over there and one over there. Yeah, questions there, pot shots over there. <laughs> Come on, questions? Well well first you, To the mic, please. Thank you, Dr. Spafford, for first guaranteeing that I will have income until, you know, I turn 75 or get as old as you, whichever comes first. Um, <laughs> and second, uh, I think that the biggest problem that we run into is getting people to take accountability for their actions. We now live, as you mentioned, where people don't need to know assembly. Uh, I got so sick of assembly typing on IBM 360 punch cards when I was in graduate school, but that's another story. But how do, how do we, you talked about changing mindset, but most people are more concerned with what their Twitter feed or LinkedIn or everything else says than whether or not they're really secure. How do we change that mindset without having thousands of laws that say, if, you park in front, if I park in front of your house and use your wireless and I send hate mail, you're the one who's going to go to jail, not me. This is a problem I've been wrestling with for quite some time, and I have a bias towards education, is, is trying to do a better job. We need to introduce some of these concepts about security into curricula that is not computing oriented. So. If we get this into law schools and business schools so that people are, are more aware of those issues, that will help a lot. Um, and it, it will occur naturally, again, because this is, is relatively new as a field. The commercial internet only goes back 20 years, which is not very long at all. And it hasn't been enough time to really percolate through um, for people to understand about the potential losses and the dangers of fraud and so on. We need to speed that up. We need to do a better job of that. Uh, now, I think we actually have an opportunity. A number of organizations right now are concerned about where they're going to get their security professionals because there aren't enough. And they're working on various kinds of initiatives. If we can inject to say, at the K through 12 level, we need to inject more knowledge about security because that will encourage people to go into the field, even if it doesn't. Um, but, but doing that is going to have the side effect of helping to or increase the awareness within a few years' time. Thank you very much, sir. You know, um, I'm going to alternate here. So, sir? Hello? Okay. Hi. I enjoyed the presentation thus far. I just wanted to bring the conversation back to Multics. And so I've done a little bit of studying about Multics, and you mentioned that uh, just you touched on the security of it, but isn't it also true that there were a number of exploits found for Multics over the years, breaking the concentric rings of protection that have been in it? Can you just speak a little bit about that? Because I just know that there have been bugs and vulnerabilities within Multics. There, were, um, there was one flaw in the early days that was found that was fixed in the hardware, that's one that Roger has written about, and thereafter people were able to introduce Trojan horses through shared libraries, but the kernel itself had, had never undergone a successful attack in the way that it was operated through, um, through the original Multics version and then the version that was running as Dockmaster uh, and, and its ilk. At least, if there were, there were no publications, there was no unclassified account that I've ever been able to find, and I've talked to 
a number of the people who ran it. I'm willing to be disabused of that notion if you have any, any citation or, or information to the contrary. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, back over here. Okay. I can't so, see very well with the lights, so I apologize. That, that's okay. I'm getting old. I can't see that well either, so we're all good there. Um, two thoughts. The first one is, you know, your comments about foundational technology and how people are not learning assembler. Well, I keep on seeing the governments run around and say, we've got to get our people trained in security and we've got to get them trained in programming and everyone keeps on running to this Java stuff. I don't get it. Um, the second thing is I keep on seeing the governments run around and say, we need laws to protect against cyber weaponization, cyber terrorism and all this stuff rather than we need to be encouraging building stuff. And the last thing is you mentioned $100,000 for a Microsoft bug. Boy, that guy got ripped off. You know, he could have gone and sold it in South Africa for easily a half a million dollars without a problem. Have. He may have. Um, yeah, neither of those was really a question, so I'm not going to. Sir. Yeah, Dr. Spafford, uh, I'm not quite as white-haired as you, but I'm white-haired enough to remember that in the 80s, People didn't want to talk about quality, and yet uh, there was Dr. Deming and a few other people who were pounding on the door and forced them to talk about it. And at this point, nobody talks about security because it's integrated into uh, the lexicon and into, integrated into how we do things. And first of all, I commend you for being a force in that. But who, who else? How do we get that same kind of force to get security integrated so that we stop frickin' talking about it. I wish I knew. Um, the, the one group that I thought might have some impact uh, were the insurance underwriters. That, that insurance drives a lot of security and safety technology adoption. Um, Richard Clark and I gave a talk to the Underwriters Association, and we were told afterwards that that evening was the highest alcohol consumption of any of their meetings. <laughs> I, I think we may have given them the wrong message. Uh, it's, not, it's not going to be sudden. I think what we have to do is we have to continue to raise this, this message. And part of it is that those, those of us who are practicing security are not in a position where we're likely to get that message across much. But if we can get it into the boardrooms, if we can get it to the C-level executives, they're the ones who show up at policy sessions. And if they begin to talk about it, it may begin to emerge more as a concern. Other than that, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm continuing to work that problem. The exercise is left to, for the reader. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. That's the best I've got. Yes, sir. Yes, I have a question for you. Concerning identity management, one yeah. of the key cornerstones of knowing what to block, what to allow, is who they are. Uh, what do you see as the, you know, we hear some talk that, you know, Facebook is going to be our next identity management source, uh, what do you see as the method of dealing with this effectively? Uh, and the method of dealing with? Identity management, how, who is actually doing what? We're entering an environment where we delegate an awful lot to agents, and so that complicates matters considerably as to who's doing what. Um, biometrics are not the answer. Biometrics are identification, not authentication. And we need good authentication. The best mechanisms I know of involve good cryptography, but we are going to have to do a better job of making it portable and recoverable. And, and here's one of the things I think has hurt us as a group is, is back in the 90s when 
key escrow uh, was being put forward by the U.S. government as a, an encryption cornerstone, it generated so much backlash that we don't talk about key escrow anymore. We're, we're almost afraid of it. And yet, for any good authentication foundation, we're going to have to do escrow for key recovery and for sharing agencies. But people just have been afraid to even approach it. Um, so we've got some work to do there on, on good management of uh, cryptographic identities that we can match potentially with biometrics or just other mechanisms such as uh, key dongles or maybe even, maybe even we'll get to that implant stage uh, to match with it. I think that's where that's going to go. Thank you. Welcome. Dr. Spafford, you're up. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take three more, you and, and the two ladies over here, OK? Your, your concern about getting security into curricula outside of uh, computer science, I think, is very valid. But I remain concerned about the computer science curricula, as you do, with, for instance, lack of assembly. About three or four years ago, I asked a junior or senior undergrad computer science major without telling him my profession, what do your professors tell you about security and development? And his answer was, they tell us don't worry about it. The security people will come along later and add it. Yes. Is ISSA an organization that can influence a change in that curriculum? Um, there are a number of organizations coming together now to change that uh, perception or trying to. It's complicated by the fact that we don't have a lot of good curriculum materials. So if ISSA can make a difference, part of it is certainly going to be to talk to groups that set curricular standards. The ACM, the IEEE, that would be a great place to start. But a, uh, another aspect of this is within your membership, um, seek out educational institutions and find out what would help us in teaching our classes. Labs, books, um, real world experience, equipment, uh, because a lot of places don't teach that. The faculty don't know security and they don't have anything to use to teach it. The, the, and then the third thing is when you when speak to your HR folks, when they go out to recruit from those colleges and universities, have them mention that. Have that mention get back to the department heads and the deans that yes indeed you want security background and if they don't have it, they're not going to rank as highly in the hiring process as somebody who's a whiz with Ruby on Rails, although you've got to get the HR folks to believe that. So I think those three things could make a difference. Thank you. Hi. Um, thanks for your talk. I have a high schooler and a, a sophomore in college, and one problem I see is kids are just not that interested in going to STEM areas. Most of my friends, the husband and wife, are engineers, and so many of the kids are doing like cartooning or music or psychology. And even people with parents that are engineering and technical, their kids are not going into that field. I was wondering if you had any comments about that. Okay, I'm, the echo here made it a little difficult for me to catch that. Uh, you said, what can you parents do to get children to go into this area? Or what do you see as a way to encourage children? A to way study to encourage children STEM? to go into this. Um, well, my own daughter just decided to go into anthropology, so I'm not sure I'm a good person to uh, uh, answer that question. Um, part of it, particularly, particularly if, for any of you who have daughters, um, we have a terrible shortage of women in the field, as many of you know, uh, just by looking around your workplace. Um, and, and part of that is, We've got to make sure that they don't get the message that computing is hard or math is hard or that it's a career where they're going to spend their time working in a cubicle because none of those things are, are necessarily true. For some people, we want to keep them in cubicles if we can. Um, but from talking to my daughter, some of her friends, some of the studies I've seen of talking to, talking to young people, uh, they're very concerned about what they can do with their life, that they're going to have fun or they're going to influence society or they're going to have an ability to grow. And we don't project very well that this field has avenues for growth, that you can reach out and work with others, that you can ascend through management, that you can work on other kinds of interesting problems. And so we have a lot to do with image, 
we need to change that. And that's going to take a little while. Hi, Professor Stafford. Just to keep on building on Jackie's question, I have a math bachelor's in science, and my question is centered more on the academic research surrounding security metrics. And you did a fine job in your talk talking about how unable we are to provide our CISOs and executives with real metrics on confidentiality, integrity, and availability, real events, and stats information and metrics. So I was just wondering if you can share what the academia does and thinks about coming up with a good security metrics body, um, security knowledge, so that we can become a real science rather than a pseudo or proto-science as we're sometimes looked at as? Well, um, the whole area of metrics and, and, and putting this on a firmer footing is, is something that over the last three or four years there have been a number of uh, studies and groups that have been talking about the science of, of security. Um, unfortunately, there hasn't been the, the funding or the data to back it up. If we're really going to make progress in this direction, uh, I think one of the first things we're going to have to do, if I heard your question right, uh, one of the first things we're going to have to do is define properties that we can measure that change based on um, how we change systems so that they affect security. And one of the difficulties there is there is no unified definition of security. Security is relative to the risk in a particular environment and is relative to its construction. We're at the point now, we continue to use CIA just as alchemists use earth, air, fire, and water because they didn't really know any better yet. Um, you got to have something to describe what you're doing. If I had better insight as to what could be defined or how to do it, I'd be doing it. Um, I'm, not, I'm not there yet. Uh, I may never be there yet. I hope maybe one of my students will be or others. Um, so I don't really have a, a, a good sense of the direction to go in other than to say we knew it needed to do a better job to come up with definitions of what it means to a system what, what we have to create, what we have to build, so that the system is secure according to our definitions. And that's the best answer I can give to what you asked. And that's the last answer. I don't want to keep any of you from, from dinner and what you have planned for the evening. Again, I thank you very much for your kindness in inviting me, and have a great time.